In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the Feast of St. John Vianney, one of the greatest priests in the history of the Catholic Church, and he rescued many, many souls from hell, and the devil let him know it by attacking him many times physically, burning his bed on fire, making noise, so it sound like horse hoofs on the ceiling or on the roof, and uh, St. John Vianney expelled the devils out of many, and was just a, a good priest. You can go visit his church where he was and see his incorrupt body where he lies, never having rotted. And uh, all, the, all the saints who have seen the Virgin Mary, none of them corrupted. Their bodies lie incorrupt. So it shows how much God favors his mother, that those who look upon her are found incorrupt for many hundreds of years even. So, St. John Vianney, <clears throat> he came in the time of the French Revolution. As a little boy, he went to Mass in a barn. He sat on his mother's knee with Mass around hay and animals in the middle of the night. And that was the French Revolution, which was the triumph of Freemasonry, not just in France, but all over the world, and also in the United States. Because Ben Franklin and the, the so-called Founding Fathers, they were best friends of the Freemasons in France. So the, the ideas are the same. The ideas, are, and they were condemned by Pope Pius VI in the, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. That was condemned by the Pope because it exalts man over God and kicks our dear Lord in the teeth, crucifies him and says, we don't need you as king. We don't need your laws in our politics. We don't need your name in our constitution. We don't need your heart on our flag. And the Sacred Heart of Jesus had asked that the Sacred Heart be put on the flag. He gave orders to the king to do this through St. Margaret Mary in 1689. And a whole series of kings, just like we have a whole series of popes now who have ignored Our Lady, there was a whole series of kings that betrayed the Sacred Heart of Jesus and never put his heart on the flag. So that shows God's mind on the union of church and state, which must be. That is the, the way it should be. The separation of church and state is a deadly heresy and disease that kills a nation. And look at our own nation. It's nice and clean and hygienic. The hospitals don't have any bacteria. They're all uh, antiseptic. But in those same hospitals, they're killing thousands of babies every day, sterilizing women <clears throat> and men, so because of the doing everything to stop children. It's really twisted and really sick and upside down. That's our world. <clears throat> but back to a saner time, when men were men, and they fought the battles of God, and the women were truly feminine and great. And one of these women was the great Queen Isabella of Spain. She is beyond veneration and praise. <clears throat> she was a great woman, a queen to, to King Ferdinand. She, she had one of the inquisitors for her confessor, and uh, St. Francis Regis also, who was one of her soldiers, who later would uh, convert when he saw her body after three days carrying the body and saw the coffin open and saw her starting to decay, he saw what a beautiful woman she was and now she's already turning black and starting to smell. And when he saw that how empty is the vanity of this world, how quickly it passes, that's what moved him to say, well, I will become a priest. And he became a priest, a Jesuit priest, St. Francis Regis. And uh, here in the United States, there's, there's even rivers named after him. Where I'm from, we have a river, St. Saint, Saint Regis River. So, the great queen of Isabella of Spain, she would be the one also, moved by prayer, she would inspire and work with Christopher Columbus, who was a third order Franciscan. He prayed the office every day. <clears throat> he was very devout, and both of them, Christopher Columbus 
and the Queen Isabella are are up for canonization. But they will the Jews, the enemies of Christ, and the Freemasons do everything to block their canonization. Because Queen Isabella, she expelled all the Jews out of Spain. The ones that converted, they could stay. They were the conversos. They really converted. But they were, they were the hypocritical ones who were called the Morandos. From that we get the word moron. It's a spin-off of Morandos. And these were Jews that pretended to convert, pretended to go through baptism, but they continued their foul, dirty work underneath. <clears throat> and one of these foul, dirty works, most disgraceful, was the frequent practice to crucify a young boy on Good Friday. And this happened with St. Saint, Saint Simon of Trent. He was, I think, a, I think he was nine years old when they, the Jews took him, tortured him, and crucified him on Good Friday. And in, and in Spain, the last straw for Queen Isabella was the crucifixion of, a, I think, a five- or six-year-old boy named St. Christopher. And he was crucified and tortured by the Jews on Good Friday to mock the crucifixion of our Lord. And another several episodes also <clears throat> brought this about, which was once there was a massive procession of the Blessed Sacrament in one of the great cities in Spain, and they passed by the section where the Jews were, and somebody from the second or third story threw laundry, dirty laundry water out, and it rained on the canopy of the Blessed Sacrament. And those men, in those days, <laughs> they wouldn't sit down and discuss. That's so infuriated to see Christ the King so insulted. The soldiers who were in the procession attacked that city and did a lot of damage. A lot of damage. So Queen Isabella, she was there in 1492 for the last battle of Granada. So for 770 years, from about 722 to 1492, that whole span was the, what's called the Spanish Reconquista, the taking back of Spain for the Catholic faith. Remember the first king, Palaio, and then <clears throat> the great El Cid, another great battler, and also uh, Saint Ferdinand, and many of the, the kings of Spain, many good ones, who led battles against the Muslims to reconquer Spain. Now, after 770 years, 1492, there they are gathered, the whole armies of the Catholic kingdoms, ready for the last battle. The men were itching, they were wanting to get this over with, and Queen Isabella said no. We must wait for a sign from God. And her husband, King Ferdinand, he wanted to start the battle too, but he respected his wife, and he knew that she had some divine connections with God, and she was cer certainly saintly. So they waited for the sign. But some of the 15 of the men of the Catholic armies, on one of those nights in 1492 before the battle, they, they went with their armor and took ladders and scaled the city walls, jumped down and made their way to what was once a huge Catholic cathedral, the Cathedral of Granada, which had been for almost 700 years now a Muslim mosque. So they stole our Catholic Church. And these 15 tough guys of Spain, of the Spanish armies, made their way in at night and hammered on the doors of the front of the church a parchment that said Ave Maria, Ave Maria, big parchment. And then they fought their way back and they scaled the walls and all of them came back unscathed. The next day there was a big Muslim, his name was Yarf, Y-A-R-F-E. 
This is what William Thomas Walsh, this, uh, this is how he describes this event. I quote from his book, Queen Isabella the Catholic. On one Saturday in August, the Queen expressed a desire to see Granada in the camp from a high place. The Marquez of Cardiz provided a great escort to make sure of her safety, and a splendid train of cavaliers rode out of the camp with their majesties and Prince Juan and the three princesses to the village of Zubia. On the mountainside, to, see, to the left of, of Granada, the city, where there was a fine view of the whole city. The Marquez of Velena and Don Alonso de Aguilar stationed their forces on the slope above the village, while the Marquez of Cadiz drew up his army in battle formation in the plain below. Thus the queen and her children were almost surrounded by a ring of steel. They entered a house in the hamlet and going to the tariffed roof, looked down with delight on the red towers and tiled roofs of the Alhambra and the massive wall too great in compass for any army to encircle. The Moors, however, supposed that the Christians were offering them battle, and as they always counted on their superior fleetness, the quickness of their horses in cavalry action, they came out in great numbers under the gallant Musa. Queen Isabel, unwilling that her curiosity should cost the lives of Christian soldiers, she sent orders to the Marquez of Cardiz not to attack, not to attack, nor to accept challenges. The Muslims, the Moors, rode near on their horses, taunting. They discharged arrows into the Christian ranks. Some of them came close enough to throw spears. Still, the Spanish army stood silent and immovable. The Moors laughed and hooted. One of them, a gigantic man on a fiery black horse, came forward alone. His visor was down on his helmet, a scimitar of Damascus steel at his side, and over his great buckler, a lance from which floated the device that showed who he was. It was Yarf, Y-A-R-F-E, the Colossus, the giant, who had thrown the insulting spear at the queen's quarters. A murmur of anger passed over the Christian armies, but it swelled into a cry of rage when they saw, dragging in the dust and tied to the tail of Yarf's horse, the placard, the, the, the cloth and with the inscribed Ave Maria that Pulgar had pinned to the door of the mosque. That was more than the Christian armies could endure, this insult to the Mother of God. They couldn't take this anymore. Garcilaso de la Vega. Garcilaso de la Vega, that's his great name. He was a young Castilian soldier, he galloped to Zubia, threw himself on the knees before King Ferdinand and begged permission to avenge the insult to Our Lady. The king nodded his consent. Garcilaso mounted his horse, closed his visor, spurred his steed, his big horse, and sped down to the plain his four black plumes rising and fa falling as he went. The Muslim Yarf saw him coming and was ready for him. So you got a duel happening in the valley. So on the walls all the Muslims are watching all this, howling and hooting, and the Catholic armies are standing like Roman soldiers, silent, waiting for the time of battle. The two came together with a shock that could be heard on the mountainside. 
The queen held her breath in fear and prayed for her champion. The great weight of the Muslim Moor had thrown Garcilaso well back in his saddle, and he nearly lost his seat, but he recovered his balance and drew his sword, while the scimitar of Yarf made a flashing arc in the sun. Time after time they closed. The swords rose and fell. Both were wounded in several places. Garcilaso de la Vega, worn down by the might of the Muslim, and by his own heavy armor, was growing tired. Perceiving this, Yarf suddenly reached over and with his gorilla-like arms dragged him from his saddle. Both fell entangled on the ground while their horses galloped away. Queen Isabel saw the huge Saracen, the Muslim, Yarf, place his knee on the breast of her champion saw him raise his dagger to plunge it into the throat of the vanquished. A wail of despair ascended from the Christian army while they watched, horrified, fascinated. They saw the Muslim Moor fall backward into the thick dust. Garcilaso de la Vega painfully arose and stood looking down at his dead foe. He had shortened his sword and when Yarf raised his arm, plunged the point into his heart. So Yarf was about to stab him, and De La Vega just took his dagger off the end of his sword and stuck him right up in the heart. He remounted his horse, De La Vega, remounted his horse, he galloped back, holding high the Ave Maria placard, hoisted triumphantly on the point of his sword. The army roared in applause, and that began the last battle in 1492. The queen saw this was a sign of heaven, and the battle began. And the, the Catholic armies rushed in on the city, scaled the walls with ladders, and there was a massive war. And the Muslims were out, were slaughtered. <clears throat> All their soldiers, most of them slaughtered. And it was a great victory from the Blessed Virgin Mary. And they all knew this. All of them loved the Virgin Mary. All of them gave their life, their sweat, their labor, their thirst. Now this is, this is Spain in the south. It's the hot desert, just like this in San Diego, California. Hot desert. So imagine fighting all day in steel with uh, metal chain mail swinging a 60 pound sword, 70 pound sword all day long, being r r cut up by the enemy, by their scimitars, and by the end of the day they're exhausted and they're thirsty. And many of them died of battle wounds. So that was 1492. And God blessed Spain's crusade. God blessed it. How? <clears throat> this is 1492. This is not even 50 years before the Protestant Revolution will rip Europe right in half. And half of Germany will fall to Lutheranism. All of England will fall to the Anglican schism of Henry VIII. And all the Netherlands also, where all the Jews were that were expelled from Spain, wherever the Jews are, there's always heresies, because they hate our Lord Jesus Christ. And we also, of course, we want to pray for their conversion. But the Jews hate our Lord. And all the heresies, Protestantism, Lutheranism, Anglicanism, and these heresies took their seedbed in the Netherlands, Holland, and parts of um, the Dutch. So these would be the very liberal, bad, modernist bishops at Vatican II from that region. So God prepared Spain. <clears throat> Because they were faithful to Our Lady, they fought for her. So God gave, in 1492, you know who sailed the ocean blue. Columbus arrived on the coast of Santo Domingo, and uh, the, the first island, he planted the cross. And when they first saw land, Columbus and all the, the crews chanted the Salve Regina and the Te Deo Naudamus. And one of the first things they did was have Mass on the island. 
So, God blessed Spain by giving Spain North and South America to convert. And they did. And that's why we are now, we are now in what was everything west of the Mississippi River was all Spanish terrain, including Florida up to the Carolinas. And everywhere Spain went were established Catholic missions, the mass in the conquistadores. When they saw so many martyrs killed in, in Florida, they realized the priests need protection. The Franciscan priests, because one of them, one of the priests, he jumped off the boat, <clears throat> walked up the beach, and the Indians came to meet him and killed him right on the spot. So he died a martyr before he even hardly landed. So the conquistadores, the, the, the Spanish soldiers, came with the, the priests, and they protected them from the Indian invasions. But the, the Catholic priests worked with the Indians and many, many converted. And that's why you got up the California coast to 21 great foundations of the missions under the great saint Juniper Barrow Serra. So, our time, the battle always goes on, gentlemen, that we belong to the church militant and we're in battle till the day we die. The church is always at war. And we're at a time when it looks like the enemies have conquered. It looks like the enemies have won. But our Lord Jesus Christ already foretold these days. Our Lady foretold these days. And for the few humble soldiers who continue fighting for the truth, the Catholic tradition, and are greatly manfully devoted to Our Lady, the victory is theirs. And the faith will carry on despite human frailty. Listen to these words of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. <clears throat> this is the beginning of his encyclical against Freemasonry. And popes don't talk like this anymore since Vatican II. But you need to be reminded. Here's what he says. He reminds of the great battle. The race of man after its miserable fall from God, the creator and the giver of heavenly gifts, through the envy of the devil, separated into two separate and opposite camps, of which the one steadfastly fights for truth and virtue, the other for those things which are contrary to virtue and to truth. The one is the kingdom of God on earth, namely the true church of Jesus Christ, and those who desire from their heart to be united with it, so as to gain salvation, must of necessity serve God and His only begotten Son with their whole mind and with their entire will. The other camp is the kingdom of Satan, in whose possession and control are all whosoever follow the fatal example of their leader and of our first parents, those who refuse to obey the divine and eternal law, and who have many aims of their own in contempt of God, and many aims also against God. This twofold kingdom, St. Augustine keenly discerned and described after the manner of two cities, contrary in their laws, because striving for contrary objects. And with a subtle brevity he expressed the efficient cause of each in these words. St. Augustine says, Two loves have built two cities, the love of self reaching even to the contempt of God, the earthly city, and the love of God reaching to contempt of self, the heavenly city. And then Pope Leo XIII goes on, at every period of time each has been in conflict with the other with a variety and multiplicity of weapons and of warfare, although not always with equal, equal ardor and assault. At this period, however, the partisans of evil seem to be combining together and to be struggling with united vehemence, led on or assisted by that strongly organized and widespread association called Freemasons. So Pope Leo XIII will tell the bishops, tear the mask off, expose them for what they are. And the bishops responded well, but after Pius X, 
the Freemasons got into the woodwork of the church. They reinfiltrated the seminaries in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. So by Vatican II, it was a Masonic victory for the enemies of Jesus Christ. And this victory is still as a stronghold over modernist Rome. And that's why we are in this fight since Archbishop Lefebvre raised the banner of war. We continue fighting for Holy Mother Church, for the glory of Christ the King, for the victory of Our Lady, until finally Rome comes back to Catholic tradition. And that's where we have to stand. And that's why we have to oppose Bishop Follet's new direction and any compromises, also of Bishop Williamson on the new Mass and some of the errors of Vatican II. Pray for them all. They're all good men, but they're making massive errors against the faith. So that's why we have to oppose even our Superior General, Bishop Follet. Because when he signed on to the six conditions for an agreement with modernist Rome, not converted Rome, modernist Rome, he surrendered to the enemies. And now, now the society over time is, is losing its fighting spirit. Absolutely losing it. So you boys, you are in this battle. Whether you like it or not, you'll be judged according how, to how you fight. God put us in this time. We must fight. We have no choice. And yes, you can go with the world. You can go with the whole spirit of the world and its whole, its whole poisons. Go ahead. But your end will be eternal damnation. And God is not mocked. He is not mocked. So if you've been baptized a Catholic, and you have the, the true faith, that means God has given you a special grace. More than many millions and billions, He has chosen you out of His love. So let's respond like those great soldiers of Catholic Spain with generous hearts and to fight this battle for the triumph of the Blessed Virgin Mary. May you be, each of you, humble and strong instruments in her hands. As St. Ignatius used to say, laugh and grow strong. Laugh in this battle, the joy of God, the joy of the state of grace, and fight hard. And remember the great one um, in the Battle of Lepanto. What was his name? The blonde haired boy who used to dance. And all the girls loved him wherever he landed. He was a great Spanish, illegitimate son of Philip II, Don Juan of Austria. Right before battle, when he was on the ships and the Muslims were coming in on them in the Battle of Lepanto, he was dancing on the prow of the ship, on the prow, dancing, holding the cross up and saying, fight for the, the reign of the Christ the King and for the Blessed Mother. Because on this battle hinges whether, our, whether all Christendom falls to pieces to the Muslims. And St. Pius V told the young men in his day, if you don't go and fight, I, with my gray hairs, will go and fight. That was Pope St. Pius V. He was no paper flower. And he's the one that bulwarked this Catholic Mass and said, let nobody mess with this Mass. So let's pray to the Virgin Mary for this, this, this fighting spirit of our Catholic ancestors who, who would rather die than see any compromise of the Holy Catholic faith. <coughs> O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.